Number 1. How many times you think you've watched the Avengers Assemble scene? Or how many times have you watched Cap lifting Thor's hammer for the first time? I'm guessing more than 10 times, but I can bet you that you never noticed this detail that I'm going to share with you now because I didn't. But after watching it in slow motion for the second time, I noticed something extremely amazing. Notice that Cap always cushions the flight path of Mjolnir, while Thor grabs it outstretched. It's because Cap is used to adjusting for the shield's recoil, and therefore whenever he summons Mjolnir or Stonebreaker, he always lets it push his hand back. But Thor knows that Mjolnir comes to a stop at his hand. It also reflects how Thor is stronger than Cap in some sense, because he's able to stop both weapons without moving his hand at all. But that doesn't mean Cap is weak. It just goes to show that he's so much used to using his shield that he uses Mjolnir in the exact same motion. Number 2. When Thanos was preparing his breakfast, he had some lit candles. And even though these are all in different shapes and sizes, but notice they're still equally balanced. And what I mean by balanced is he has 6 pieces of candles. 2 large, 2 medium, and 2 small. Number 3. When 2012 Loki disguises himself as Captain America and imitates him, it confuses Hulk for a brief moment. It's because this Hulk is not that smart enough. So he wasn't able to figure out what Loki did there for a second. But once he realized Loki used his magic to impersonate Cap, he became very angry. Number 4. Now we all know this scene where Doctor Strange holds up one finger to tell Tony Stark there's only one way. But after this rewatch, I just figured it also takes exactly one minute from when Doctor Strange holds up one finger to when Tony snaps his fingers. Number 5. Now for this detail, you have to listen to the score for the title card of Infinity War. Now that you've heard how that score sounded like, let's hear the score for the title card of Endgame. Let's go get this son of a bitch. It sounds different, doesn't it? It's because half of the instruments used in the opening title card of Infinity War are not present during the Endgame title card. So even the background score is missing another half in this movie. Number 6. Quark shows signs of moss or lichen growth on his body due to the nature of his and Thor's lazy lifestyle. Number 7. When Steve Rogers and Tony travel back to 1970 to retrieve both Space Tone and Pink Particles, there we see two more familiar faces. One is a cameo by Josh Brolin himself and the other is Christopher Marcus, who is one of the writers of this movie, dressed as a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent. Number 8. Tony's fall off from the Stark Tower parallels his fall in Avengers 1. And in both scenes, Tony is suiting up with Mark 85 and Mark 7 respectively. Now we all know that, but here's something new. The nanotech Mark 85 suit up is more nonchalant and roughly three times faster than Mark 7, emphasizing how advanced his technology has become. Number 9. Professor Hulk can be seen wearing glasses, which is nicely detailed with fingerprints. Now obviously fingerprints would exist on a glossy black frame and the reason I'm counting this as a detail is because you can see that Mark Ruffalo wasn't wearing any glasses while shooting. It was all added in post-production and the fact that they decided to add fingerprints in the frame again goes to show the attention to detail. Number 10. In Avengers 1, Tony says to Loki, There is no version of this where you come out on top. However, in this movie, an alternate timeline is created, in which Tony Stark is partly responsible for Loki coming out on top. Number 11. At the beginning of the film, the Banatar resembles a swallow when it was drifting around in space. Now, swallows are a symbol for loyalty, hope, and the safe return home after a long journey. And thanks to Captain Marvel, Tony and Nebula make it back home in one piece. And that's why Marvel deliberately made the ship look like a swallow, foreshadowing Tony and Nebula's safe return. Number 12. When Black Widow jumps and sacrifices herself for the Soul Stone, Hawkeye briefly looks away. Now this could very well be because nobody wants to see their friend's head getting crushed. But there could be another reason why Hawkeye looked away. It might be because of his enhanced far-sightedness. Number 13. After Hawkeye comes back from the past as a test run, if we pay attention to the background, you'll see that Scott has some orange slices ready for Clint. It's because he knows entering the quantum realm might make you super dizzy. So an orange might be a help to stabilize yourself. Number 14. When Tony Stark traveled back to 1970 to get the Space Tone, he looked through multiple lockers to find out where the Space Tone is. Now, one of the lockers he scanned contained Gamma Signature. So even before the Hulk was born in the MCU, S.H.I.E.L.D. was already working on Gamma Radiation. Number 15. Almost all the Avengers made fun of Back to the Future movies. But upon this rewatch, I just found this visual similarity between Back to the Future Part 2 and the final battle of this movie. Well, this is heavy. There's that word again, heavy. 
Why are things so heavy in the future? Is there a problem with the Earth's gravitational pull? Number 16. At this point, almost everyone is aware of Howard the Duck appearing in the final battle, but I wanted to give you lads something more. So I counted how many frames does he appear in, and found Howard the Duck appeared for a total of 18 frames. That's less than one second. Number 17. When Tony Stark went back to 2012, his suit retracts from the beat first, while entering Stark Tower in order to land more quietly. Now of course RDJ wasn't wearing any suit in real life. It's all CGI. So hats off to the VFX team who pays attention to every detail. Number 18. While discussing when and where to get the Infinity Stones, Thor is using eye drops, but notice he only puts them in his left eye because his right eye is robotic. Number 19. During the opening scene with Clint's family, many birds can be heard in the background, but when his family gets dusted, the sound of the bird diminishes by half as well, indicating the snap not only affected human lives, but all lives in general. Number 20. When the Avengers have to use the van with the quantum tunnel, Captain America asks, Anyone see an ugly brown van out there? Yes! But you're not gonna like where it's wrong. But pay attention to Tony's heads-up display. When he says we can't get the stones back because Thanos destroyed the quantum tunnel, there's no indication of the van in his map. But when he asks Ant-Man how long would it take to get the van working, his map of the battlefield is updated with the red blip of the location of the van. So even without Tony asking, Friday automatically located the van using Valkyrie's instructions. For 21, a lot of people wonder how did Rhodey end up in his new suit for the final battle? Well, if you watch the scene when Thanos attacks the Avengers compound in point to fabric speed, at one point Ant-Man answers Rhodey's call for help, and there in the background, the Iron Patriot Mark II armor can be seen which Rhodey wears in the final battle. So it's safe to say, not only did Ant-Man save Rhodey, Rocket and Hulk, but he also made sure to get this new suit to Rhodey. Number 22. Right before Thor exchanges Mjolnir for Stonebreaker from Captain America, Mantis can be seen in the background putting to sleep one of the Chitauri gorillas, using her empathic powers. Number 23. When Hulk and Rocket go to New Asgard to bring Thor back, we can see this big figure walking in the background. This is the same gladiator that escaped with everyone from Sakaar in Thor Ragnarok. Number 24. Thor has Hulk and Iron Man test dispensers in his room next to Stonebreaker. Number 25. Now this detail detail has nothing to do with slow motion, but it's something that I observed. One thing that bugged me after I watched Endgame for the first time is why did they decide to kill off Tony Stark while keeping Cap alive? We knew this was the last movie for both actors, and perhaps they could have given Tony his happy ending by letting Cap sacrifice his life for all humanity. But the thing that I realize now is that Captain America couldn't die in this movie, because he was willing to die in the first one, and that wouldn't really be a journey. So maybe for Steve to be his best son, he was going to have to get a line, and for Tony to complete his arc, he might have to lose his. And that's it. This completes my entire Infinity Saga rewatch at point two.